um, that with that, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. If Mr. Blackwell, if you can call roll, please. Jennifer Harden. Here. Linda Grassi. Here. Tom Hack. Here. Lori Kroniski. Here. Jack Miley. Here. All right. And with that, let's go ahead and do the pledge. Can you do our flag, Gary? Uh, we can't because the sharing is disabled, so we'll have to go without the flag. Okay. <laughs> Here. I pledge allegiance. I, I have a flag on my lapel. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic the for which it stands, and one nation, nation under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome all staff, students, uh, parents and interested community members to tonight's Board of Education meeting. I would like to remind everyone this is the meeting of the Board of Education held in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. There is time for public comment during the meeting in the public participation section of the agenda. Can everybody hear? All board members can hear everything, all administrators, everybody who needs to be. Okay. Um, please be sure to speak up immediately if you cannot hear or see anyone or someone during the meeting. Governor DeWine signed amended ha substitute House Bill 197 into law. This new law is a response to the health risks associated with the coronavirus outbreak. Among other things, this new law lo allows public bodies such as boards of education to conduct, conduct their meetings using telephone conference, video conference, or other similar technologies. This law became effective on March 27, 2020. The Riverside Board of Education is committed to the health, safety, and welfare of our students and their parents, our staff, and our community in general. But even in these times, the board needs to take certain actions to keep the district operational now and fully functional in the future. For these reasons, the board will forego an in-person meeting tonight to avoid a gathering of our community members. We'll conduct this meeting by video conference and we'll live stream this video conference meeting to the public in accordance with this new law. If a member of the public wishes to submit a comment or question for consideration as part of the public participation section of this meeting, please use either the raise hand function or chat feature in Zoom. We ask all public viewers to disable their camera and mute their microphone during the meeting except for the designated public participation section on the agenda. The Board of Education will, will suspend portions of certain bylaws which are not consistent with amended House Bill, substitute House Bill 197. This will ensure compliance with the amended substitute House Bill 197. At a later date, the Board of Education will decide whether any of its future meetings will occur via Zoom or other means based on information available at the time. Thank you for your time, consideration, and patience during this difficult time, and thank you to our entire administrative teaching and non-teaching staff for all of their hard work during this difficult time. I'm going to make a motion to suspend certain bylaws on recommendation of the superintendent of schools and in light of provisions set forth in amended substitute house bill 197 signed by governor mike dewine on march 27 2020 permitting electronic meetings of public bodies in ohio the riverside local school district board of education hereby suspends the operation of bylaws 0100s definition of voting and bylaws 0166 and 0167 to the extent that they require a board member's physical presence at a meeting to vote and by Law 0162 to the extent that it requires physical presence for the purpose of a quorum. He determines that this suspension shall take effect immediately to cover the entirety of this meeting from commencement to adjournment. Action taking in this resolution and all action taken during the meeting prior to the passage of this resolution. C finds that there are compelling reasons to adapt the suspension and D directs that all other portions of bylaws 0100, 0162, 0166, and 0167 shall remain in full force and effect. If I can have a second, please. A second. Thank you, Mrs. Grassi. Is there any discussion on any of that? If not, call the roll, please. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Motion carried. Next up, I'd like to make a motion to approve the April 28, 2020 board, board minutes. If I can have a second, please. I'll second it. Second. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Is there any discussion? If there is not, call the roll, please. Mr. Harden? Aye. Melinda Grassi? Aye. Tom Heck? Aye. Lori Kroniski? Aye. Jack Miley? Aye. Motion carried. And that takes us to special reports. We do not have any special reports today. Okay. Um, old business. 
Okay, how about new business? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Kalish, I just have a, a question. I, I know there's been some conversation about what the, you know, the fall might look like. And I just wondering if you could put in a nutshell some of the things that, that might be in the, in the hopper that uh, would be of interest to, to certainly, certainly me as a board member, perhaps other board members, as well as some of the people listening in. I, I actually have a few topics that I'd like to um, talk about during my presentation that I think aligns with what you're asking. Perfect. Thank you. If there's nothing else, it will take us to the Board of Education Committee and liaison report. The first up is the superintendent's business advisory. Um, without having the senior, we should have had a, our last meeting for, during the senior project fair, which obviously that is not unfortunately able to happen. So I will be looking for us to have a meeting once the new school year gets underway. Um, that takes us into curriculum and programming and boosters. Okay, boosters, uh, we haven't had a meeting. Um, Due to the situation that we're at, at hand, a uh, curriculum meeting on May 12th at 8 a.m. Um, we talked a little bit about what we might see for 2021 school year. Um, again, there's going to be quite a few talks about that and whatever the situation allows us to do at that time. Um, we are moving forward with regards to like kindergarten registrations and things like that. So um, that part of the old business is going on. Um, for the ending of the 1920 school year, um, we talked a little bit about teacher PD that's going to be taking place from June 2nd to June 4th. Um, finalizing some activities like the clap out and uh, graduation and I take it Jim you'll probably be talking about those two things I will okay and then um, we discussed also a parent survey that was given out we got over 1,000 uh, and 23 responses back um, discussing all kinds of things um, and I think we're getting a summary of that on the website also. Um, and um, parents had a chance to give their opinions on things like assignments, grades, social emotional type things, uh, and special ed. So a lot of good, good feedback there. And we liked the, the response total that we got. Uh, we like to continue to grow that. We also talked about the uh, upcoming uh, welding lab and um, we're moving ahead with that. Um, TDA is going to, um, should be finalizing everything for bid. And we talked a little bit about special ed and um, some reductions in force um, going on in that department. And, um, I think that's it. Um, Tom, anything else? No, Jack, I think you covered it all. Thank you. Okay, Melissa, we good? I don't know where she went. Okay. I'm still here. My internet is, yeah, my internet is wonky, so I have my video turned off. No, Jack, you, that was a, a good summary of everything that we talked about. Thank okay. you. Thank you. That's it for Sorry. That's it for my stuff. Thank you. Um, that takes us then to finance and audit personnel legislative, Mrs. Grassi. So we had a finance meeting on the morning of May 19th, which was last week, and we talked about the five-year forecast, um, among other things, uh, most notably being the personnel evaluations that have been completed um, using a little bit of a different protocol. Um, other than that, like I said, we have the five-year forecast. I'm going to allow Gary to speak to that. Um, we talked about some different scenarios and what things will look different if we have some things that come up over the summer that we don't have information on at the moment. Um, so he will cover that. So that's all for the Finance and Personnel Committee. Um, some of the things that are going on legislatively, um, 
that there has been a moratorium and a, the, a bill that's been approved that extends the uh, storm shelters for construction, new school construction progress to, uh, projects to November 30th of 2022. So I'm not exactly sure if that has to go through any other voting right now, but that passed the, the Senate passed that it's Senate Bill 248. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. A couple of conflicting bills running through right now, both the House and the Senate regarding um, improperly passing a stop school bus and using school bus cameras to serve as evidence and the dollar amounts of fines that can be um, levied upon people for that. Um, there was some talk about the CAUV, which is the agricultural use value uh, for folks that need to reapply for that program each year. That is going through committee. Um, and then there was another amount of $5 million, which was being requested to help fund ESCs to assist in the hiring of social workers and mental and behavioral health professionals. Um, and so we're just following that as well. Uh, and the thing on the agenda right now is the opening, reopening of K-12 schools. OSBA provided some testimony. I don't know if anybody had an opportunity to check that link out and read the actual testimony that they have provided. Um, it was a couple of pages long and um, they just had some things to say about like trying to get that information and get that information out soon, sooner rather than later so the districts can plan appropriately. And that's it. All right, thank you very much. Buildings and grounds, operations, alumni, Mr. Heck. Sure, so the um, easiest one up front, there, there was no alumni association meeting. Um, I, I may have mentioned this last time, but uh, there, there was a donation from the Alumni Association to Riverside to help pay for some of the senior signs for graduation. So they, you know, they certainly want to be remembered uh, at this time of, of, you know, the coronavirus uh, crisis, I guess, for lack of a better term. We did, um, so, so we, we definitely want to thank them for, for, for that donation and for their, their thought, thoughtfulness. Um, with regard to billions of grounds, we did meet on the, the 21st, which was last Thursday. Um, you know, the, there isn't a, you know, it wasn't, uh, there's not a whole lot, lot to report. We are looking to replace some, a boiler at Lamouth, and so we're, we're starting the bid process for that. Um, and once we get that number, we'll, we'll definitely discuss it again at the billions of grounds committee and then move it forward uh, to the, uh, the full board for consideration. Um, they're going to do some patching of the, of the uh, parking lot, uh, particularly at, at Lamouth, um, but, uh, and, and all the, the buildings are going to get some attention, but there's uh, also going to be some work done with the, the storm drains at, at, at Buckeye and, and uh, at Riverside at the, the campus. And we are still working the, the punch list for the, the new buildings. We are coming up on the, the time when we will take full possession of them. Right now, just for people's memory, we, we are kind of under a warranty period. So as we identify things that need to be done, there's a punch list that's been worked down. And, um, and we are managing that to make sure that when we are in, you know, when it comes time for the transition, that, that all the things that the, uh, that ICON, the, Instruction manager at risk is has accomplished all the things that they are responsible for. Um, so one one thing that came out today, uh, I saw there was an email. Uh, there there are issues. Many of you certainly, if you have children at, at the new elementary schools, you've probably noticed the the cement issue, the concrete issue, uh, particularly at at, at uh, Parkview, excuse me, Parkside. And uh, there was some analysis that came back on some core samplings, and, and it, I'm surprised by the results. And so I, I will be moving forward to have a Billings and Grounds meeting next week so that we can discuss. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry for speaking. Um, anyway, uh, that is it, unless there are any questions. No, thank you. All right, that takes us into the policy committee and strategic plan liaison, Mrs. Kreski. Uh, we have not had a policy committee meeting or a strategic plan meeting since the last board meeting, so there's no update. 
Um, I missed a lot of that. Did you say there was no update? Yeah, no update. We have not had a meeting since the last board okay. meeting. Thank you. All right, that takes us on Dr. Kalis to the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, as everyone knows, uh, there have been additional orders that have been made by the governor's office in the Ohio Department of Health. Not a, a lot of it uh, includes any guidance on transportation. Um, however, I was able to get some information that's been discussed at the ODE. And, and from what I gather, this is not anything that uh, is set in stone, but it's something that they're talking about at the state level about how um, districts are going to be expected to provide transportation to students come fall if things don't change with the um, health crisis. So what I understand, what I'm hearing is that um, even with buses of 72, when I say 72, that means that it's three uh, students per uh, bench. There's 24 benches in a, in a in a bus and uh, if you multiply it by three, you get 72. Um, rarely do we have that many students on a bus because only small, real small kids can go three to a seat. Um, you know, what's, what we typically have is two to a seat and uh, that would be 48, obviously, if you take 24 and multiply it by two. Anyway, um, what they're looking at is putting one student per bench on a bus which would mean the, that the capacity would be 24 students. Now that's a little bit better than what I heard before. Before I heard it was gonna be every other bench that they would put them on for about 12 kids. So you can imagine that this is gonna be very difficult to transport students at, with 24 to a seat. Um, the exception is that if there are members of the same household, there's more than one can sit on that bench. So if you have siblings, that are picked up at the same time, they can sit together. I pulled all AM routes to gauge how many students ride buses in our district. Um, and I pulled one typical AM bus route with 56 students, nine stops. By using what I'm hearing uh, from the Ohio Department of Education, that um, we would be at 24 student capacity after the fifth stop. So we don't have, we cannot run our transportation uh, department uh, in a way, uh, in a manner that we have in the past if we have these regulations. We I mean, know there's other things we've been talking about too is, you know, what are the other options? One would be to start, you know, stagger school times and try to uh, increase the number of tiers that we run, um, possibly reduce service at the secondary level and put our resources at the primary and middle or simply buy buses and uh, hire drivers, which is pretty impractical considering that we would have to probably cl close to double our, our capacity. And we have difficulty as well as other districts in the whole area in hiring uh, bus drivers. Other, um, other things that I've been hearing about is that uh, they would also recommend that we take temperatures of kids getting on the bus. Um, it's not a requirement, uh, but it's, uh, it's to strongly um, encourage it and consider it. This just doesn't make any sense to me because I believe it would be a huge liability that if you are taking the temperature of a child getting on the bus, and if they are over the benchmark of temperature, what are you to do? Are you uh, keeping them from getting on the bus? Do you go to the next stop and let that child try to walk back home? I don't understand how they would expect us to do that in a manner that's going to be um, safe for the child. Um, also, uh, some of the other things we're talking about is that having drivers and students wear masks uh, on the bus, um, also applying hand sanitizer when they're boarding the bus. Um, <clears throat> they would board the bus also where kids would get on and they would go to the back of the bus and we would slowly fill the bus from back to front, and then when we arrive at, uh, the, at the school to unload, it would be front to back, that makes sense. Um, but when you're departing the school to take students home, you'd have to get the students, we have the longer bus route to get on the bus first. You know, the longer bus uh, route for those kids would be the ones who sit in the back, and uh, then you would fill the bus uh, in the front. You'd have to sanitize each seat with high touch surfaces 
uh, in between bus routes as well, which makes uh, sense too. There was also some consideration, like I said, between having nine and 14 kids on a bus. That doesn't look like it's gonna be the case, but they also mentioned having bus drivers wear face shields and having shower curtains on the bus as well. From what I understand, the Ohio Highway Patrol already said that they're not gonna permit that because they believe it's a danger with the face mask that it might fog up. Bus drivers won't be able to drive with the face masks on. And they can't see to the rear of the bus with those shower curtains hanging there as well. That is that is transportation right now. Again, none of this is- Jim, Jim can I ask a question real quick about the transportation? Because I see that Coach Gore is on here too. Um, obviously, if that's what we're looking at, you know, I know in my experience, you know, we, we pack those buses when we're going to sporting events, right? The cheerleaders are all in there, the football players, basketball, whatever. I mean, are we going to be looking at then increased potentially pay to participate fees? I mean, because it's going to significantly increase each team's cost just to travel. It, it is something we should consider. I haven't looked at it close enough to know what it's going to cost. But um, understand that even with um, sports, what is even more concerning is uh, the lack of resources, the lack of drivers that we have. You yeah. know, at the end of the school day, sometimes buses are delayed uh, because we don't have the driver back yet from another route. So now if we have to increase that uh, number of buses to go to an athletic event or, or some type of uh, other uh, event that our students are involved with, we're going to be late. And, and it's going to be a problem. That is just one area. We're looking also at cafeterias. Um, from what I've been reading is that you have students sitting in every other seat facing the same direction. Now the capacity at Riverside, at the Riverside campus cafeteria, the main cafeteria and also that auxiliary room that we have, um, has a capacity of about 320. Roughly speaking, if we put everyone at every other seat facing in one direction, the capacity would be 86 students. We also looked at JRW's cafeteria as well. Capacity is 292. Again, under the same conditions where we have them every other seat facing uh, in the same direction, we can seat about 93 students. So it's gonna be an issue. W with that being said too, um, I did ask uh, Michelle Gifford to be in on our board meeting uh, today, and she's gonna give a real quick update uh, on her department, and then we're gonna go through uh, some athletics and also latchkey, um, and, and what we're doing and how we're responding to some of these restrictions. Michelle, you got a couple minutes, uh, if you can give us a quick update. Okay, um, I just wanted to update the numbers of the students we've been feeding at the, it's three buildings, um, because we do, service Fairport Harbor's lunch program. So we are serving lunch out of Harding High School as well. Um, but out of Buckeye and Riverview alone, we're already at about 10,000 meals for the month of May. That's breakfast and lunch. Um, Buckeye has um, really jumped in numbers. The first week they had about 115, 120, and they've been averaging 200, 210. So 210 students, they get three breakfasts, three lunch. It's a lot of meals those ladies are preparing. So um, I'm looking for May to outdo April. Um, for April, I think our total meals for each school were about 3,000 and Buckeye's already at 4,300. So um, they're good numbers. And I, I have a staff set up for summer. Um, we can serve all the way through August 31st. Obviously, school will be starting in that time frame, we hope, but we're gonna serve meals all summer long at those three buildings, which should uh, keep revenue flowing in. Hey, Michelle, that is, first off, like super impressive and thank, so awesome what you guys are doing. Um, could you essentially send that information to Nick so that we have that and it's something that we could, I think that's something that's really important that we should be putting out there to the community, how much you guys have actually done and how much service we're giving to our community by doing that. I would like to see us be able to, you know, really promote what you guys have done because it's really amazing. Sure, what you're accomplishing. thank you. Um, do, you have, do you want me to send them numbers of how many meals we're doing? Yes. Okay, please. I can do that. Michelle, can do that then, are we doing well financially on that? I know USDA is picking up the tail for all of that. So uh, Gary and I have chatted a little bit about the status of my fund and 
I believe um, I was potentially going to break even um, at the end of the school year. So with hiring the staff for summer, the number of meals that we're serving, I'm hoping that I will continue to be um, in the black or very close because this is revenue we've never tapped before. So, you know, it's, I don't know what it's going to look like, but if it's bringing in $50,000 in June and July and August that we never had, you know, that's good money. We certainly don't lose money on it though, right? Because I mean, by, by the time they're done paying for the, what we do, like it's, it's paying our costs. I would hope. I mean, we're losing some because on a, on a regular day in session, we're serving thousands of meals. Um, you know, we serve probably 600 on campus actual meals and then 150 to 220 at all the elementary schools. So I'm not doing those numbers obviously, you know, for the people that are coming to pick them up. But I also don't have a lot of other costs. You know, I'm not buying as much food, you know, as much milk, those kinds of things. I know, I think you're doing a, you guys are doing a tremendous job. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have additional restrictions as it relates to groups and using the athletic facilities too. The director's orders came out uh, last week where there's guidance on baseball, softball, batting cages, golf courses, nature golf, local and public pools and aquatic centers, uh, tennis facilities, training for all sports and general non-contact sports, including uh, bowling alleys, like I said, with some exceptions. Um, now, we don't have to worry about all of this because we don't have a pool, nor do we have a bowling alley. But in terms of pool, we do have a uh, latchkey, and latchkey in, in any uh, given year, they go on a lot of different types of field trips and they go to the pool pretty often as well. I will get to Latchkey in just a minute, but I wanted to touch base on some of the uh, restrictions coming out from the state um, concerning athletic facilities, because even though the school year is almost over, we do have a lot of youth groups that use our facilities throughout the summer and also um, in the, into the fall. And um, again, uh, some of these restrictions are, are, are are going to be, uh, I think, problematic for some of the groups. But uh, in terms of baseball, you have to have a six-foot physical distance while in the facility. Uh, you must conduct daily symptoms assessment by coaches and the players. It's a self-evaluation. There's to be no team coolers or shared drinking stations. They have compliant game balls where, where sides of the athletics, they use their own ball. They have a prior to competitive tournaments, uh, event owners must alert the local health department of the event. Well, we're the owner of the facility, but we may not be using it. It might be the sport. So we have to get some clarification that our youth um, non-school sponsored baseball teams use our facility. Who is responsible for letting the local health department know of the event? Here it says the owners. The board's the owner of the property, but you're not using it. Um, <clears throat> Requirements must be shared prior to an event. They can't just share them while they, they, um, while they arrive. Lineups need to be entered online or, spoken, uh, uh, or by spoken word. Uh, that's a strong recommendation. Athletes travel to the venue alone. I don't think too many 12-year-olds uh, are going to be driving their own car, so they're going to have to go with their parents or their immediate household. There's other things that are involved, too. Um, depending on what group you are. If you're an athlete, if you're the athlete, if you're the umpire, there are a couple other things. For the baseball athlete, you can't share equipment either. Now, I've been involved with youth sports and I know kids share bats. You have a, a catcher that catches maybe a couple of innings and then another kid, you know, catches, then another kid uses a batting helmet and all those things need to stop. You can't have any type of, of uh, sharing of equipment. No sharing of water, no, um, no uh, water equipment, like large jugs or anything else. They're not allowed to high five. They're not allowed to shake their, their, the opponent's hand. Afterwards, they're supposed to tip their caps. Um, so there's a lot of other things going on. Also with spectators, there are a lot of expectations for uh, expect, uh, spectators as well. Now, I've asked Dave Boers, our athletic director, to come uh, to, to speak to how we're going to handle the use of 
our facilities because as of as of May 26th, we can have our, our student athletes come in and use the weight room if, if they wanted to, but there are some restrictions. Um, we've been working on this for the past few days. Um, there was some discussion about uh, holding off till opening it till June 8th, um, almost as a um, conference-wide date. And I said after so many months of being in quarantine here that I don't want to wait an extra week if we don't have to. So Dave has been working real hard to see what we can do to open it up by June 1st. And if our uh, athletes want to use it, we'll be very careful in uh, making sure that they follow the restrictions and uh, they can get back on track. Dave? Yeah, hey, good evening, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Good. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm using my phone for audio, so I just want to make sure. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks, Jim. Yeah, and I'm not going to get into every single little guideline, but I'm trying to give you hopefully a vision of what we have pictured, knowing that it's constantly evolving. I mean, it, it's evolving from yesterday to today, uh, depending on who we talk to and collaborate with, in addition to what the Ohio High School Athletic Association hands out, and then obviously the governor's office. So we take all this information and data. Uh, Pete, Jim, uh, myself, Dan Wainer, uh, enlisted the help of uh, Michael Patterson, our Lake Health uh, certified contracted athletic trainer, uh, to get his guidelines, because he's in the He's in the front line of it right now when he's not working with the school districts. He's at the urgent cares in the hospitals. He's, he's doing all that stuff. So uh, working with him to kind of get things situated. And um, so here's kind of what we're looking at today. And knowing that the rest of the week will evolve and we'll, we'll kind of get things settled and make them more concrete. Um, the Ohio Department of Health and the governor's office handed out their, their restart guidelines for all sports. It was a skill training philosophy. They handed out, you know, some, some decently specific guidelines. And then the Ohio High School Athletic Association piggybacked on those and handed out their guidelines that are only recommendations. They stress they want to make sure that the local districts have the final say because the local districts know with their clientele and their stakeholders and everything about their district, what it entails. So, and obviously working with the, the county health board, um, which I had a phone call to them today, we were not able to make contact. So, That'll be another phone call I'll be making tomorrow and, and following up with. But what it's going to look like, first and foremost, social distancing of six feet or greater is number one. Uh, the governor and the state is not putting an actual number on what that looks like in terms of people. The Ohio High School Athletic Association is recommending 10 or less, including the coach. They're using the term pods, where let's say if we use the stadium, a group of 10 or less could be in one corner, another corner, another corner, another corner. So you can conceivably see 40, 50 student athletes and coaches in a stadium at one time conducting drills, skill sessions without necessarily um, doing anything wrong. So now the weight room, let's say, for example, or the field house or the Riverside Gymnasium, those spaces are obviously smaller. So that would have to be dealt with uh, accordingly as we go through. And that's something that you know, uh, Michael Patterson, our trainer, and I will be doing here the next few days. We'll be walking the campus facility, taking measurements, and seeing what realistically we can do within those guidelines and parameters. Um, we're talking about having a pre-screening checklist for all athletes when they come in. Uh, we're looking at obtaining a few uh, touchless uh, thermometer guns. Where all you have to do is point it. Don't to, no, no contact takes place. Point at the forehead, and it gives you an instant reading. We're going to track all that data not only to make sure that everybody's in compliance, we're also going to track what groups each kid is with and coach. So if heaven forbid there is an outbreak and there is a diagnosed case of COVID-19, we can now confine those groups that were part of that. So it's not going to be necessarily a whole, a whole team, a whole day of people being in there, but at least we'll start with the group that was there. Talking about propping doors open, one way in, another way out. So there's no cross-contamination between people coming and going. Um, uh, we've talked, Dan Wayne and I, in our meeting today, uh, we're going to, he's going to, I'm not going to, but he, he and his staff and crew, uh, they're going to start putting up uh, hand foam uh, sanitizing dispensers everywhere. We're going to have a, a bunch of them. We're going to have from field house to out near the stadium to the weight rooms uh, on down the line. So that's going to be access. We're going to uh, saturate uh, those places with uh, the squirt bottles filled with the, 
the antibacterial solution that kills the COVID-19 uh, with paper towels. We're going to have an abundance of garbage cans without lids, so nobody has to take the lid, close it, and open it, but it's a lidless garbage can where just after you're done wiping things down, um, that'll be taken care of. The custodial crew every night will go through and, and kind of once over everything, uh, specifically the handles and the switches and everything else. Each program that uses the facilities will be responsible when I'm in the process of putting together um, what our rec requirements are for our coaches, athletes, spectators, all that stuff. Um, they'll be responsible for sanitizing as they go and then when they're done. So it's not going to be we have to wait for custodians. It's, it's everybody that's using it is going to have those guidelines of how we're going to treat our facilities and what the expectations uh, are to make sure that things are sanitized appropriately and before the next group comes in. We're going to stagger start times. So it's not going to be an 8 to 9 and a 9 to 10 because we want to make sure no groups are crossing. So it may be a first workout's 8 to 8.50, the next one's you know, 9 to 9.55, uh, so on and so forth. So that, that's another way that we're looking at. Uh, we have an athletic director. I mean, we've been meeting as athletic directors for uh, the seven counties, essentially Northeast Ohio, uh, weekly and sometimes uh, a couple times a week. We have another one on Thursday. There's been, I think, two schools that tried to open today. Um, from what I understand, so far so good. So we're looking forward to seeing some of the recommendations, suggestions that they've got um, after having a couple days under their belt, some things that they've done. Um, other districts are looking at June 1, some are looking at June 8th, uh, like Jim said, where it just depends on, on uh, what each school district is comfortable with. But it, when these came out late last week, uh, Jim and I immediately communicated, and, and it looked like Harry told you, it said he wanted to see if we can go June 1, and I agreed. And we figured this week uh, to get all the ducks in a row and, and take care of stuff uh, could be sufficient to do that. So that's that's just kind of nuts. So just stuff off the top of my head, just some – some notes. I mean, I'll open it up. Things that I've been looking at the data for so long now that I'm still assuming you guys know stuff that's already just in my head. So, so please, anything that that uh, you have questions about or thoughts, that that right now is a Tuesday at 7:39 is kind of where we're at. So when you're looking at, you're talking about coaches having to take temperatures and things like that. Are we looking at having to like mass purchase all those kind of digital, you know, like infrared thermometers and get those to every you know to every single coach because we're certainly you know the coaches were all kind of all over the place physically right you've got them at Lamuth and at Riverside and you know is that a, is that a cool. shared thing is like or what are the, the thoughts on those kind of things like are we how are we budgeting for those kind of new expenses too Gary from what I understand yeah, it's not, is somebody talking yeah I I'm sorry go ahead though Go ahead. Okay, so no, I was talking with Michael Pearson today, and he came up and he got through the group discount, and he, he does a great job of making sure that we can get the best prices on all of our, you know, equipment and stuff that he needs for a trainer. So he was today he was talking to his boss after we talked. We talked to him about 1 o'clock this afternoon, and he was going to go back and start giving me a price point for things we're looking at, including his recommendations. He was going to talk to the other athletic trainers in the county. He was going to talk to, like I say, his bosses and see what they thought we should do and how we should go about it. He also is going to be here starting June 1. So we will have his assistance in helping screen and whatnot. I know he will have some of that equipment already as just part of what he brings to the table for us. So, Jen, I don't have an exact answer yet, but we're getting that hopefully very soon. If it's something different than what's in the recent orders, then that's something we need to talk about because – the recent orders say must conduct daily symptom assessments by coaches and players, self-evaluation. Anyone experience symptoms including cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell must stay home. Doesn't say anything about, you know, uh, using a temperature gun to uh, well, the reason I was asking too, you know, is that we know it's it's one thing at the Riverside campus that's then Lamuth's like kind of just a whole different island right. off there on its on its own. You know, at the campus, it seems like you guys can probably when you've got the trainer there can maintain that little the consistency a little better than we probably have over at Lamuth. No, and that's fair, and that's what that that we need to discuss and figure out. And um, you know, it, it, the next thing too is is in the next probably thirty six hours like we do with all our sharing of facilities, just figuring out from each coach and each program what they're looking to do this summer. 
You know, so we have the summer skills versus what we have come August 1, you know, when seasons actually start. So, yeah, so we'll figure out, and that's something I'll be able to collaborate with Michael Patterson as like, okay, here's what we're looking at. Here's the teams that want to be in at this time. Here's what we can fit here. Here's the ones going on at Lamouth, what they're planning on doing. Um, and what, what does that look like? So, yes. So I have a question. Who is there anybody who is going to be assisting us with the purchase of hand sanitizer and disinfecting solutions? That's it's expensive. It's hard to come by right now. And and districts all over are going to be I mean, we're going to be going through this stuff like in mass quantities. We um, we're working with the uh, Western Reserve uh, ESC uh, right now. They're trying to get us some pricing um, and uh, I haven't heard back from them yet. Um, we've been receiving a lot of emails on um, companies that are peddling, um, you know, the, the PPE type equipment. Uh, so at this point, uh, we're going to wait to see what the ESC provides us. And I would like to go through uh, the ESC if indeed it is the most, um, you get the most bang for your buck because all the districts uh, are going to be pulling the resources to buy from the same um, vendor, I believe. So what time, what, when do we anticipate opening, opening for stuff? June 1st. Right, so that's next week. There, I mean, if we haven't placed orders for this stuff yet. We, I'm have, we still have some uh, now. We still have, we don't, we're not out of all of it. We still have some. Because you can't have these kids coming on without, without Thank you, Michelle. that available. I'm just concerned we won't have enough. Well, my other question for that too, Dave, is, you know, with, I know that, you know, we get all these notifications as parents and coaches of um, physicals that are expiring. So how are we collecting that to make sure that our athletes, if they're coming in, have their appropriate physicals on file? You know, are we having them mail them in? Are we going to have the coaches watching who's coming in and all that? I mean. No, and that's a good question. And usually what happens, Jen, is, is through the off season stuff, is the season not going to physicals? don't normally uh, aren't really tracked as much during this off season time It's more okay. so cannot participate day one come August one or whenever that season starts. So as of right now, um, there's, there's no specific guidance or guidelines from OHS AA on those. Okay. Um, obviously the restrictions are also going to have an impact on our summer camp plans through Latchkey. There's a lot of discussion on whether or not we were even going to have Latchkey. Um, today, I would like to um, I would I would like to have uh, Julie Bialco talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, in handling some of the restrictions and how it's going to impact the program. It's not going to be the same type of program that we've offered in previous years. Uh, so we we would still like to provide it for our parents. Right now, I believe we're down by about 20 students or so than where we would be at this uh, particular time. I do not know if that number is going to increase. I anticipate it will if we provide uh, the camp um, and let the parents know exactly what we're doing to keep their kids safe. Uh, other than having uh, one camp supervisor to nine kids or some other things that we're doing as well. Again, I asked uh, Mrs. Bialco uh, here to give you a, a quick update. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I did submit my, my plan for summer camp. Um, along with the Responsible Restart Ohio guidelines from Governor DeWine. I submitted that to Rob Graham, the Lake County Health Commissioner, and he took a look at it over the weekend, and he made some minor adjustments, um, but he has approved my plan that I submitted to him um, to conduct camp uh, for the kids. Um, of course, it won't be like, like I normally do with field trips and that sort of thing, um, but for the parents that need, need child care, I think we could um, have something for them. Um, I would like to move the program to Riverview instead of Buckeye. Um, it gives me extra space for the kids to have um, nine kids to a room. So it's nine kids, one counselor. Uh, I cannot mix the kids together, so they will stay kind of like, that's how we do when we go out, like go out to the zoo or anything. We're broken down into smaller groups anyway. So it can be like that all day long. They'll have the same counselor to work with all day. Um, I, I, put it, I put into place where the kids could have their own art boxes. So they have everything they want to do, you know, coloring, pencils, markers, crayons, 
that is theirs personally in a shoebox type thing. It's theirs for the entire time that they're at camp and they can take it home with them when camp is over. Um, same with like uh, Legos and that sort of thing. I can sanitize Legos. They'll have their own box, they could use it and we could sanitize those at the end of each day. Um, I purchased already because I, I, if I don't use it for summer camp, I'll use it somewhere down the road for uh, latch key, the thermometers that scan their foreheads. So um, Governor DeWine's, one of his guidelines is that you have curbside drop off. So we can have the, the parents drive up to the curb and we will greet them outside. We will take their temperature. If they have a temperature of 100 degrees or higher, uh, we ask that they, that they go home. Um, and then we will walk their, their uh, student into the, into the building, into their prospective classroom for the day. Uh, we could use the cafeteria. We can use the gym over at Riverview. And we also have the playground that the kids can go out and play in their own groups. I will not intermix the groups together. Um, and then I, I, in my plan, I just said we will, we will uh, clean frequently touched areas, doorknobs, handles, to the, to the bathroom, and that sort of thing. Hey, Julie, one quick question that I didn't ask you when we were talking about a lot of this. It, will parents at least have some ability to, if there's friends, to be in the same group? Yes. Friends okay. and siblings, they, 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 yeah. We can, we can manage all of that, that um, as soon as we know who's okay. coming and, you know, the drop-off times, we could stagger them so they're not all coming in at the same time. But I will have counselors in, in all the rooms waiting for the kids to come in. At which point, at this, at this point, we're also canceling all the field trips. We're going to play it by ear in terms of later on in the summer, if, if we can go on some of those, we'll revisit it, correct? Yes, yes. Um, and the food service, a bonus to the summer campers this year would be food service can provide the meals that they're providing to the other students. They can provide uh, breakfast and lunch to latchkey students as well. So that's a big plus for some, a lot of families. Good. Um, and I also would like to reduce the cost a little bit to the families just to, because we're not going to be taking all the trips, especially in the beginning. Um, I would like to reduce it by $25. To, so I'll make it $120 per week for the families. Is that okay with the board? Okay. Yep. All right. So we're going to go ahead. Uh, you're going to start on June 8th, correct? You set to start on June 8th, yeah. Okay. Any Is questions? Is when we would have been starting? Yes. Yes. Any questions for Julie? Thank you. That was great work. Thank you for yep. everything you do with the kids. Thank you very much. It's going to be different this year, but... We'll, we'll get through. I'm sorry, the, the, the presentation is long. There's two, a couple uh, other items. Um, one is the fifth grade clamp out of schedule for May 29th. The par parades will begin at the elementary buildings with the exception of Parkside, which will start at Riverside for routing purposes. Each parade will consist of a lead bus, 10 to 15 cars and an end bus. Teacher participation will be voluntary. The decorated cars and buses will travel the routes of where our fifth grade students travel to get to school. Um, Donna from Transportation uh, Department has been really helpful, but, and she created the routes, including estimated times, which will be shared with the parade participants. Students will need to go to their designated bus stops to see the parade, as the buses will not be able to navigate through every neighborhood and down every single street. Instruction for parents will include information about parade, as well as safe social distancing practices at the stops. What time is it going to start? Um, I don't have that. I will. Uh, I'll get it to you. Okay. At ten a.m. Uh, yeah, we're oh, starting at ten o'clock. Yeah, sorry, ten o'clock. Ten a.m. All right. Also, in May of a typical school year, the Riverside campus hosts the incoming eighth graders during a portion of the day, so they can get a feel of what it's like at the campus, like a normal day at the campus. The incoming eighth graders are given a tour of the building and an opportunity to interact with a panel of current Riverside campus students. This is part of our phase in process to help our new students get acclimated to their new building and is followed up with a day in August before the first day of school where the incoming eighth graders are given the opportunity uh, to walk their schedule and attend a brief presentation by administration and our uh, school guidance department. With the current uh, school shutdown situation, we still felt strongly about keeping this part of the program for our incoming eighth graders. 
Mrs. Wakeham and Mrs. Falvey, uh, assistant principal and, and guidance counselor, organized a six separate Zoom orientation sessions that met with the incoming eighth graders during their designated science class time at LAMU. Mr. Liatsos and Mrs. Wakeham addressed and welcomed the students. A student panel of current Riverside campus students were present to answer questions. Um, Mrs. Falvey served as the moderator and additional items uh, shared with the incoming eighth graders included an RHS campus highlight video, a flip grid, which was advice to eighth graders, um, and also a flip grid for advice for the class of uh, 2025. Um, they did a really nice job uh, with that. And um, one more thing I would like to mention is um, the effort by our um, advisor, Jamie McIntyre at the high school, who has been doing a lot of work uh, to make graduation something for our students to remember. Uh, she was able to pass out the caps and gowns on the 13th and 14th, I mean the 14th and 15th without too much of a problem. And she's been uh, handling all the logistics that are involved with the commencement uh, that we're planning for June 13th and 14th. I just wanted to give a shout out to her for all the work that she's done. Our district is so fortunate to have her and the likes of um, Stacy Lucas uh, working so hard for our students. Um, they're great to have uh, here as uh, serving our students. I would agree. They're amazing. They are. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Hey, I have All one right. question. Sorry. I have one question. Yes. When, if we do latchkey at Riverview, um, any of the maintenance that's going to be done, will they be the punch this? around? No, Dan already talked with Chris from um, ICON, and he, he won't be in any of the classrooms. And anything that he needs to do, he won't be in our way. Okay. We took care of that last week. I just wanted you to be aware. Okay, I'm aware. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Then, Mr. Platico, you are up. Okay, I have uh, several updates for the board, uh, and then at the end, we'll go through the uh, five-year forecast since it's uh, since it's the May update time. Uh, first update I have is I received correspondence from Andy Rose, which is the Con Concord Township Administrator. Uh, just some residents had some concerns about the trees and the property along the north property line uh, that they're a little bit short. Some of them are a little bit shorter than what the settlement said. Uh, so there's uh, about seven trees that are a little short, a few that are dead. Um, I sent those off to ICON uh, so they can take a look and um, see if they can get that remedied as, you know, part of the bid package was to have seven, eight foot trees along that line. A few of them seem to be a little short. So he's looking into that and seeing what they can do in that aspect. Um, in regards to the Haddon property, uh, the property in the back working on closing uh, on the transaction to the township, the zoning uh, has gone into effect, the rezoning, and now we just need to get some documents signed, which you know is a little more challenging that we're all working from home, but uh, Mrs. Harden and I are gonna be working on that the next couple of days, uh, get a few things signed and follow the three quarters office. Uh, for the front portion, uh, we're looking to a possible lease or lease to purchase option, uh, but that, that's more of initial talks on that. Uh, just, you know, so the buildings I'd say they're vacant and to partner up with other organization. Um, since our last meeting, uh, actually our last meeting was on the final day of the election, the primary election, and we had the passage of the Lake County School Financing District. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here and to show a few of the results from that, uh, just to show how it uh, varied from, from last uh, November. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share this here. There, are you able to see the spreadsheet? Yes, that's good. Okay, yeah. the left columns is, is just a breakout of all the precincts from the Lake County School Financing District, which includes the Riverside School District along with Painesville. Madison and Perry. There's a lot of detail. It doesn't all fit on the screen, but F kind of shows the difference between the yes and no votes um, in past in many of the precincts, except for Concord B, Leroy Township A and B, Madison Township F and G, NBA, and then Hainesville Township C. 
things which is punished with decay. So in most precincts that passed, as a summary, let me scroll over just a little bit here, and these columns here shows it by community, and you can see that it passed in every community except for Leroy. Uh, overall, is well supported with 58.24% passage rate, um, which is, you know, good for us that that's, that's been renewed. It's been renewed for 30 years. Uh, I wanted to just kind of compare what that looked like from November. If you remember in November, the levy did not pass by 30 votes. And uh, let's see, it's a little bit smaller. Hope you can see it side by side. Flat going over a little bit more. There we go. And you can see comparing the yes no's from this this election to November, you can see some some major swings, uh, especially in Concord Township where it passed by 413, where in November it failed by 411. Uh, Leroy, it passed, well, it's, it's, even though it failed in Leroy, it's, it still came out much better. Uh, Madison Township also had a, a pretty big swing, and also in Perry Township, and also the, the very small portion of uh, Geauga County that, that levy falls into. So I think we, you know, we did a much better job communicating. Uh, it was obviously a unique election with the circumstances, uh, but now the, the levy will, will continue to be in effect through uh, calendar year 2025. So that will that that was a big change that that affects our five-year forecast. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, also, um, we're getting bidding through the House Schools Council for our, for this year's bus purchase. Um, as as we've been you know working through our replacement cycle of five buses a year, uh, we're planning on doing another purchase of five. That will probably be on the June thirtieth agenda. Uh, we do have a school bus purchasing grant for the state of Ohio of about $18,000. So that would be about one fifth of a bus that that will support. Uh, those funds have not been cut yet. The possibility those funds could be cut, but uh, we did apply for the grant, which we had to do by May 20th. Um, so assuming that funding is still available after July 1st, and then hopefully we'll be able to, to use that towards one of the five buses that we purchase. Uh, State budget cuts, obviously that's a big topic to discuss. Um, the governor announced back in early May a 3.7% cut to public education for the state of Ohio in the current biennium, the current fiscal year, which ends on June 30th. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't 3.7% across the board. It was much heavier, heavier weighted on districts of quote unquote, more wealth, basically those who have a higher property tax capacity, basically based on property tax valuations. Uh, it kind of correlated with the, uh, under the old state funding formula, there was a state share index that districts of higher property tax valuations had a lower state share index and that was used to develop these cuts. Basically the inverse of that. So the cuts were more heavily weighted on districts like Riverside, Menor, Willby, Eastlake, Mayfields, Beechwoods, Orange, districts like those where we're seeing the, the hardest hit. Uh, so our, our budget cut is actually 13.4% of our state revenue, which is $1,119,055 that's being cut in this fiscal year. What they will do is they will recoup those funds from our state foundation payments so we receive two payments a month from the state. So they will make that adjustment in those reports. Uh, the only issue is because our funding cut is so large that there is not enough funding left this fiscal year to recoup those funds. So it makes us go what they call insufficient. Uh, there's about 90 districts in the same situation as Riverside where they're being cut by more than what's remaining in our payments for the fiscal year. Our cut is $264 a student based on ADM. ADM is a, is a way that uh, is, a, is an enrollment measure that the state uses, but also includes enrollment of students who attend charter schools as well. So that, that's counting our ADM, so our cut it was more than just the students we have sitting in our chairs. It also includes charter school students. Now they did cut 
charter school funding that gets deducted from our funding by $88.76, but that's fairly small compared to Riverside's $264 student cut. Um, what will happen is since we do not receive enough funding, this enough payments this the rest of this fiscal year, we have the option of A, cutting a check back to the state of Ohio by June 30th, or B, rolling it into fiscal year 2021 into our payments in that year. So that's option B is the one I'm going with. I'd rather have the uh, cash in the bank right now earning interest than to cut a check back to the state. Uh, also, we're a member of the Alliance for High Quality Education. They're working with Senator Dolan to try to get a fix in place, try to offset some of those cuts. So if by chance that does get, uh, makes it through the legislature and those funding cuts change, then if we had already paid back the money, now we had to get the money back from the state. So I figured it might be easiest just to roll it into next year. So I kind of wanted to show, I'm gonna share my screen again, what the state funding uh, looks like as far as how they calculate this. And I'm sharing the wrong thing here. So let me stop it. So from the Ohio Department of Education, we get a report on each payment that kind of breaks out the detail of what it looks like. And this screen here, this is May payment number one. So we get two of these a month. And you can see on line A here, our annual funding amount is $8,351,708.66. So what they do is they you know show what we've been paid to date, what's our balance prior to this payment and what our semi-monthly payment will be. So this is May number one before our cuts. So you can see our gross payment would be 347,000. Then they add some additional aid items such as preschool funding, special ed, transportation funding, and student wellness funding. And add these additional items to a total payment of 360,000. And they deduct items off of that such as money that six dollars fifty cents a student that goes to the ESC. They add in open enrollment in, deduct out open enrollment out, community school transfer, STEM school transfer, scholarship transfer, some other things. And then so a total of ninety thousand is deducted from our gross funding. Then they take out some more adjustments for excess cost tuition and other tuition items, uh, college credit plus. So the you know the free courses that people take at Lakeland as our students. We do pay for those through dedu deduction from our funding. Uh, so our total payment gets down to 214,000. Then they deduct um, the employer portion of our retirement systems, the state teacher retirement system and the school employee retirement system to a net payment of 56,623. So that was May number one. Now that they've updated for the state funding cuts, you can see our funding amount drop to 7,232,000. So if you remember, that was, I think on here, 8,351,000. We've already been overpaid at this point based on that. So then they do a negative, so our payment's negative 25,000. Then you add in our additional aid items, take us down to negative, negative 12,000. Then they deduct off all these other things. So another 84,000 is deducted off the negative 12,000. It's really funky math when you're looking at it. And by the time you get all down here, they add this new line in our funding, state insufficient funds, 151,000 to get our net payment down to zero. So basically our payments reduced to zero for May number two and then June number one and June number two, we'll get nothing from the state. There's also won't be funds available for the retirement system, so we'll have to cut a check to the retirement system, and basically we'll have a zero payment the next three, uh, next three payments. Um, essentially, when July comes around, we're still going to owe back 455,000 to the state for this current fiscal year. It's really a funky, funky math of how it works and how it shakes out. Um, and it's just, it was a little surprising being this late in the fiscal year because you know my colleagues were, we, we knew cuts were coming. We never dreamt it would be this significant this late in, in the year. Um, 
and you know it's something we have to have to work through. Uh, we will be receiving funds through the Federal CARES Act to help offset some of the um, additional costs for going doing online instruction. There's uh, uh, caveats in there we can use it for continuing operations and things like that. Uh, so we're working on figuring out exactly how those funds will be utilized. Um, when we talk about the forecast here, you know, we, we know we're going to be providing hand sanitizer, cleaning supplies, you know, barriers, you know, plexiglass barriers, all that stuff. You know, how much is that really going to cost us? Uh, we don't know for sure at this point. Um, you know, do we need to increase custodial staff to have additional cleaning? Do we, you know, we, we're going to have to work through all those once we know what the what the guidelines are um, that we need to follow, assuming that we're, we're back in session in the fall. And, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot to consider. And so when I get into the forecast here, um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a lot of unknown. So I'm going to go ahead and give me one second here. I don't have my slides ready yet for the forecast. I did do a, a typical uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, here, let me just get this up here. All right, is everyone able to see the slideshow? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, so it's, it's you know, we've, I follow the same format with the, uh, with the PowerPoint I typically do each uh, May and November. Uh, so we'll go through some of it quickly, but we'll also focus on some of the key areas and, and, and what that looks like. Um, so this first slide here, and this gets posted on the Treasurer webpage of, 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 the, of the Riverside website to include the forecast, the assumptions, and this presentation so it can be referred back to. So there's a link here, just some guidance from the Ohio Department of Education, kind of goes through the forecast line by line and, and what each of the items mean. And so some, just some general information. Uh, the first bullet point is probably the key one. The five-year forecast contains estimates based on the best information available at the time it's prepared. So if we went back to November, and I would have told you that the last day of in-school instruction would have been on March, the, the Friday the 13th in March, and that the state was going to cut 13.4% of our revenue by the end of the fiscal year, and we do remote instructions for the rest of the year, you probably would have told me I was crazy. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, things do change. We, you know, we always try to predict what that is, but, you know, sometimes things come at us that obviously we, we, we didn't anticipate. Uh, so the forecast is required to be updated and filed at the Ohio Department of Education in November and May of each year. Uh, there was some talk of possibly extending the, dead, the May deadline. Uh, but, you know, are we going to know much more in June as opposed to May? You know, that's to be seen. Uh, the forecast includes three pr previous years of actual data and five years of forecasted data, which includes the current fiscal year of 2020 through 2024. And the numbers of the forecast only tell a small part of the story that you got to read the, the assumptions to truly understand what goes in those numbers. And our forecast is unique because it includes the general fund and the Lake County School Financing District Fund. Uh, the general funds required the financing district because we use it for instructional purposes for salaries for certain core subjects. We include that in our forecast. Uh, an executive overview. We're still solvent through fiscal year 2024. Um, there are obviously many challenges and uncertainty due to COVID-19. Uh, we now projecting deficit spending next fiscal year. And that's because of the state budget cuts. That's where expenditures exceed our revenues. Uh, this current fiscal year included a new state by in budget, uh, but obviously we had those significant budget cuts that came into play here this month, uh, So, and there's more cuts to come. We'll talk about those later. And the Lake County School Financing District, after we already discussed, was renewed in the Ohio primary election, which continues through calendar year 2025, which covers the first half of fiscal year 2026, which is two years beyond the five-year forecast at this point. Uh, we will see an increase in revenue. Uh, Right now, you know, we're because of the new allocation among the, the four districts, uh, each district will receive the funds that it generates. And uh, so revenue for fiscal year 20 is at 2053000 uh, They'll increase to 
2.35 million next year and then 2.67 million the following year based on our estimates. Um, there's the, the executive overview, very, just a very abbreviated uh, five year forecast. You can see in fiscal year 20, we started the year at $12.7 million cash balance. We expect revenues around 48. 0.5 million with expenditures at 45.8 million, leaving a revenue surplus of 2.6 million, which increases our cash balance to 15, almost 15.4 million. So we're projecting the end on June 30th. Uh, fiscal year 2021, you know, starting the year at the 15, almost 15.4 million. Revenues have gone down from last year because of the state funding cuts. Uh, so that gets us a 46.7 million is projecting right now. Expenditures increased in the 48.1 million. So we have a deficit spending of 1.3 million, uh, lower our cash balance, and we continue deficit spending uh, through the life of the forecast. Obviously, there's a lot can change. So if you know things change dramatically before November, we'll definitely update the forecast there. Uh, we are going to be using a new forecasting model going forward. Uh, so you know we'll see how, how things shake out there. Uh, this chart here kind of shows revenues versus expenditures, revenues being in the blue, expenditures being in the red. So these first three years, 2017, 18, and 19, are actual data. Back in 2017, when we passed the operating levy, those started collecting in 18 and 19. You can see the revenue jump. When you can see the revenue dip now that we have state funding cuts going into 20 and 21, and then hopefully restoring back in 22 and beyond. Um, this is just a pie graph of our revenue streams. Property tax makes up 59% 59, 59 of our revenues. Unrestricted grants and aid that your state funding is at 17%. Uh, public utility tax at 6%. This says property tax allocation. That's the official name from ODE. That's actually your homestead and rollback reimbursements from the state of Ohio. That's 7%. And then all other operating revenue that includes the, finance, the joint finance and district revenue interest revenue, Medicaid revenue, pay to participate fees, classroom fees, and all kinds of miscellaneous items as well. So property taxes, 59% uh, of our revenue comes from property taxes. We're primarily a residential community at 83%. Uh, looking at our total tax valuation, just over a billion dollars, we are finally exceeding 2019, which was when the Great Recession was occurring. Uh, so we're finally back to that point and finally exceeding a little bit. Uh, increased valuation though only, only results in additional revenue on inside millage and if it's new construction on the substitute levy. All of our operating levies are a continuous period of time. Um, the 4.9 mil operating levy that was passed in May of 2017 started collecting in 2018 and it's currently collecting at 4.56 mils. Um, and we did, I did put in about a 1% decrease in collections due to COVID-19, uh, just based on historical data. We probably won't know much until July what that really looks like. Is it gonna be less than that? And even if it's collection is less, doesn't mean it won't be collected. This would be more of a timing difference of when it'll be collected. Uh, you know, delinquencies can carry forward from year to year and those can catch up um, at a later time. Uh, so this is kind of just the, the bar graph showing uh, prior years, you know, uh, when the operating levy passed back in 17, started to increase, and then it levels off again uh, going forward in the forecasting years. Uh, what are our current levies in place? Um, right now we have inside millage of 4.8 mils, the cumulative levies through 1976 of 11.84 mils, the 1980 levy, the 1986 levy, uh, 2009 substitute levy that was originally an emergency levy and then a, the 2017 levy brings our total general fund millage to 30.34 mils. We have a permanent improvement levy that goes into a separate fund that's not part of the forecast at 2.3 mils and then the phase one construction project debt uh, originally at 1.92 mils is now collecting at 1.55 mils that's to pay the bond, uh, bonded debt uh, from our construction for a total millage of 34.19 mils. Uh, that doesn't include the, uh, the financing district. So comparison of tax rates in Lake County, um, Riverside has the third lowest in Lake County. Uh, Wycliffe has the highest school district tax rate at 63.78 mils. 
uh, that was based on they had recently passed a, a large bond issue that, that was around 13 or 11.47 mils excuse me and then uh, Painesville City's the next at 4.47.34 mils Fairport Harbor's at 47.29 mils they had a, a 4.4 mil levy or so on the ballot in the primary election and uh, that did not pass Willoughby East Lakes at 46.84 mils their levy did pass it was a 4.94 mil levy that's not included in this total uh, Kirtland's at 40.34 mils Riverside's at or uh, Minner's at 38.29 mils with only Madison and Perry lower than us Perry you can't really count because of the, the power plant they generate a lot of revenue there uh, so we're fairly close to Madison, and I hear they might be going on the ballot uh, here in November. Unrestricted grants and aid, that's what includes our state funding formula. As we've already talked about, the cuts of the 13.47%. So we're expecting 653000 recouped in FY20 and 455000 in FY21. For FY21, we're projecting an 18% cut in revenue. Um, you know, we're cut 134 now. That was kind of a guess we don't really know. Uh, Aaron Roush from the Department of Education pretty much said expect a cut of the same, if not more, percent this year. Um, they will probably use the same formula they used before. For some reason, ODE thinks it's a, a, uh, a fair way of cutting funding, which, uh, you know, when Aaron Roush said that on our, on our meeting, treasurer meeting with Lake and Geauga County, which were most of the districts in those counties were hit pretty hard. We didn't think it was real equitable the way they did the cuts. So hopefully they will consider other options um, when they do this year 2021. So an 18% cut is 1.5 million. If it changes dramatically from that, we'll update the forecast and go from there. Uh, casino revenue as well is normally $52 a student. Um, 2020 is already collected. We're projecting $35 a student in fiscal year 21 because the casinos are closed. And I, you know, I believe they're gonna be opening in the near future, but they're probably not gonna be opening at their normal capacities. Uh, so this was kind of a, what we were suggested to forecast going forward, but you know, that, that could change as well. Uh, $52 a student, you're only talking a little more than 225,000 a year. So it's not, it's not a significant, I mean, it's obviously an important revenue stream, but it's not, you know, significant like our state funding or property tax funding. So this is more of a bar graph that kind of shows, you can see in 2021, it, it dips down. And then for 2022 and 2023, we're projecting at 95% of 2019. What that will look like when those times come, we won't know probably till June of 2021, what the next biennium budget will look like. As of now, 95% of 2019 is what we're we, what we decided to go with. Then there's property tax allocation. That's the homestead and rollback reimbursements from the state. That's about 7% of our revenue. And I always just leave this in here. Uh, just the TPP phase out that's been reduced to zero. We used to get 3 million a year. That got phased to zero a couple of years ago. And this is kind of a bar graph that showed how that was reduced back then. And now it's just pretty level going forward. The other revenue, 4.7 million, about 10% of our revenue. That includes the joint financing district. We just talked about that renewal. Uh, pay to participate fees, we're projecting at 141,000. That's lower this year because of spring sports being canceled. Um, we're expecting around 200,000 starting in fiscal year 2021, assuming things go back to somewhat normal. If things change, we'll obviously have to revise that. Open enrollment ends, estimated 675,000. Uh, Classroom fees are down to 180,000. That was a little bit of a dip this year, I think, because of the economic uh, situation and just the way things went out this year. Um, we're kind of expecting that to return to a more normal level next year as people uh, catch up on those. Medicaid reimbursements at 320,000. We're expecting a $280,000 uh, cost element, uh, from 2018 to come this year. Uh, if it comes a little bit later than June 30th, they'll be in the next fiscal year. Uh, interest revenue, we're expecting 250,000 this year, uh, decrease that to 150,000 next year because interest rates have been uh, slashed dramatically. Um, so Star Ohio is not earning what it used to. And so that's what we expected uh, for next year and, and going forward. 
And it includes other things such as kindergarten, well, kindergarten tuition doesn't apply anymore, but preschool fees, field trips, rentals, fines, manufactured homes, tax, things like that are also included in that, uh, in that number. And this kind of shows a graphical of it. You can see a little bit of an increase as we collect more from the financing district in 2021 and 2022, and then it starts to drop down a little bit. Expenditures, salaries makes up 52% of our expenditures. Uh, benefits about 22 so for a total of 74% of our of our expenses. That's pretty typical in you know in school districts. Purchase services is about 21%. We'll go through that in a little bit. And then supplies and materials about 1.4 million. There's about 3% of our expenditures. Um, there's no slide on that uh, coming up, but for supplies, we did project an increase of 100,000 for next fiscal year um, based on early estimates and depending on how we use, utilize the Paris funding of you know, who we know the guidelines and what, how much hand sanitizer and masks and all that stuff we need to provide, we're not really sure. Uh, as Dr. Kalis mentioned earlier with the ESC, purchasing supplies to them, they have a calculator um, that will be used like went through the exercise to see what, what the true cost might be to go through an entire year based on some assumptions of how many squirts of hand sanitizer, are you providing masks, things like that. And, uh, you know, will be like, you know, not quite twice our size, but they were, their calculator came out to about $2 million in protective equipment and sanitizer and things like that. So, so that's not, that's substantial, you know, and that I'm not sure what they use in their assumptions for that, but I mean, that's, that it can be expensive really, really quick. Um, just salaries, you know, includes our, you know, basically all salaries of, Certified, classified, or, you know, um, also our, you know, under union contracts with the teachers union and OPSI, uh, OPSI expires this year and the teachers contract expires next year. Uh, so the forecast, you know, reflects what we know at this time as far as what those salaries would be. Um, benefits makes up about 22% of our expenditures. Most, you know, Medicare, retirement, and workers' compensation is based on a percentage of salaries. But also includes medical insurance, dental and vision. For medical insurance, we're expecting about eight percent increase in the cost of medical, dental and vision about three percent. Um, we're a member of the Lake County Schools Council that helps uh, off, help keep those costs lower than than the industry averages. Uh, one thing that was was good is uh, the Lake County Schools Council announced a health insurance premium holiday back in March for the month of June. We had the option of picking June or July. We ended up picking June. Um, so that's a savings of about 485000 We do not, basically what that means is we don't have to pay the healthcare premiums for that month. Um, they also be the deductions from our employee paychecks for their portions will be, will be removed, um, will be reflected in their paychecks in June. So it'll be a, a little bit of a bump to the employees, you know, not having that deduction, but also a huge savings to the district uh, because we don't have to pay those health insurance premiums for that month. Um, that really helped keep this year's benefits in line, but next year we'll go back to, to normal levels. Uh, purchase services, about 47% of that is based on um, tuition-based costs. So that includes like your open enrollment out deduction. So it's students who live in our community that attend neighboring districts. Uh, community school deductions of 230,000. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out going forward. If, if, if we're in session as normal in the fall and, and some may decide to go to an online uh, community school, that will increase. Um, scholarships out, 960000 and then other tuition related items, is $1.4 million. A lot, of that's, a lot of these expenses are outside of our control. But this also includes many things such as special ed services, instructional services, utilities, postage, printing, security, tracted uh, transportation services, or insurance coverage. It also includes substitute teachers because we track it out through the ESC of North Ohio. Um, we saw some savings in some of those categories, reduced uh, utilities, uh, reduced substitute costs and things like that. Uh, depending on how the school year looks next year, uh, you know, those could vary. Also, uh, cash flow wise is the graphical um, de depiction of that. Here, OD recommends that we have a uh, 30 to 60 day cash balance. So that's reflected in this kind of a lime green line. 
and kind of shows how our cash flow varies each month. January into February is usually when we see our lowest cash flow. So we're still, you know, we have a good cash flow at this point, even with the, the budget cuts from the state of Ohio. Um, that's, you know, good financial management is to stay, keep our cash above that line. Um, just so we have a good uh, rainy day fund for additional, you know, issues that may come about. Uh, so what could change? I always have this slide on our, on our presentation. I did not have COVID-19 on it in November, <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously the state revenue cuts from the state of Ohio, what that really looks like. If it's, you know, we projected 18%, if it ends up being 10%, then that's, that's pretty good. If it ends up being 20% or 25%, that's obviously not good. Uh, property tax collections, you know, will collections be higher? Will collections be lower? You know, I imagine they could go lower, possibly, depending on how this thing progresses. Um, you know, I left it on here enrollment spikes because of the Fairway Pines development and the Encore Heisley Park development, both fairly large developments happening in our community. Uh, obviously, home construction is slowing down a little bit, but, you know, those seem like those are, are still popping up in those developments. Or on the flip side, could have enrollment decreases due to online schools or you know we may have changes to open enrollment policies going forward so we'll see how that how that pans out on the revenue side for expenditure side you know staffing levels how, how that might change healthcare plan changes purchase services the community schools covid-19 supplies how much more will that cost us for masks gloves sanitizer cleaning supplies also looking at you know transfers to other funds from the general fund so like nutritional services if we aren't able to maintain in the black, what does that look like? You know, usually nutrition services has a very healthy cash balance going into the next year. Um, with everything going on, it, it's gone down a little bit. So we got to monitor that. Athletics is another thing to consider. Um, you know, what does the fall sports look like? You know, what if they say there's no spectators during football games this fall? I mean, that's a big generator for the athletic fund. If we're still playing football without the spectators, we're going to have to transfer probably funds to athletics to support the program and then how we're going to utilize the CARES Act funding, you know, is it going to be used towards some of these COVID-19 supplies or towards purchase services for technology and things like that. Uh, so that takes me to the end of the slideshow. I just wanted to open up, see if there's any questions from the board at this time. Gary, I just want to make sure that when we at the finance meeting, we, um, we talked about making sure that we put all the supplies, the expected COVID supplies back into the budget and taking the core, the CARES money is kind of external. It's not even, it's not even in the budget because we don't really know exactly. I, I guess we know how much it's going to be, but we're, we're considering utilizing that for other purposes. Correct. So we put that money, the, the supplies, at least some portion. Right. We, we did put some portion back into the forecast. Uh, you know, once we know more of what we're required to do this fall, we'll kind of adjust from there. Um, so, you know, things could, you know, depending on how, how we can utilize it, the CARES funding is kept separate from the forecast because it's kind of for a separate fund and we'll kind of uh, monitor how we can use utilize that and, you know, adjust from going forward. All right. Thank you. And that uh, concludes my report. All right, thank you very much. That takes us to public participation. If I can get back to that, I lost it somehow. Anyone wishing to address the Board of Education will be recognized by the Board President. Speakers are requested to identify themselves and their topic comments are limited to three minutes. So if there's anybody that wants to, they use a little hand function, I guess. No, anybody, Nick, showing up? You're muted, Nick. We did have a question earlier in the chat, which uh, Dr. Kalis did address, but I saw that. figured I'd, we should, if we want to read it publicly, just in case people aren't reading the chat section. Can you do that, please? Uh, the question was from Kathy. It says, will the kids in Latchkey summer camp be required to wear masks? Dr. Kalis's response is my understanding that Latchkey staff will Required to wear masks. I do not believe students are required. These stipulations have been approved by the Lake County General Health District. So. Okay. Very good, thank you. 
There is nothing else that will take us to the consent agenda. A consent agenda provides for more efficient use of time. Any board member can remove a consent agenda item to be discussed and voted on individually. The first thing we have is finance and audit. Sure, we have a recommend, uh, we have a agenda item to approve the items listed on the finance and audit consent agendas recommended by the treasurer items A through I. I have a second. I'll second. Um, I just wanted to read the donations that we had a donation from Brian Levon to the Riverside Athletic Fund in memory of Jim Haffa. We had a donation from Aero Fluid Products to the Riverside Fast Pitch, and we had a, a donation from Greg Miller to the Riverside General Fund. He's probably giving back his lunch funds. <laughs> lunch funds. Um, so we'd like to thank those folks for doing that. Is there any other um, discussion on the finance items? Uh, I was just going to ask on the Chromebook purchases, what grade are we, is this a, to replace for a grade this year or for, is this for the new, what is this for? Who gets the new ones this year? Uh, I know it's to replace uh, two grade levels. I'm just not sure which ones. I don't know if Melissa knew exactly what grades or yeah. I can't remember who gets the new ones this year either. And I don't have that stuff sitting in front of me. I'm sorry. It's just our regular rotation. I just don't okay. know who it is. I was just curious. Yeah, we were able to do a joint purchase with Kirtland, uh, saved us a few thousand dollars. And with our original quotes were on our own because we're Good. buying a larger quantity together. Good stuff. Yeah, if there's no other discussion, Gary, can you call the roll? Linda Grassi. Aye. Tom Heck. You're muted, Tom. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Motion carried. Personnel. Hold on, I'm getting to that page. There's a lot here. Sure, we have a motion to approve the items listed on the personnel consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent items A through F. Do have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Um, teacher contract renewals are on here. We have a lot of information on here. A couple of resignations for whom I'd like to thank those folks for their dedicated service to the district. They've been here a long time. Was there any other discussion on those items? If not, can you call the roll, Gary? Tom Heck. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Linda Grassi. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, next item is item H. We have a resolution to approve, approve the employment of Chris Hastings, head coach for girls soccer pending fall sports for 2020. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Lori. Uh, if there is any discussion on that, and if not, can we call the roll? Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Jane. Linda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, next up, we have item I, payment of supplemental contracts. We have a resolution regarding the payment of supplemental contracts for the extracurricular activities covered the period of March 13, 2020 through the last day of the 2019-2020 school contract year. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Is there any discussion on that? And if not, can we call the roll, please? Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Jane. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, Lori, I'm gonna ask that you read the next one, please. Yep. So it's a resolution to approve employment of classified substitute for summer maintenance, Marco Grassi. For the second. I'll second. You read the roll. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Epstein. Tom Heck. Nay. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. 
Motion carried. Takes us to curriculum programming. Curriculum and programming motion to approve the items listed in curriculum programming consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent A through C. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? I'm just going to congratulate those graduates that are never see as the Riverside class of 2020 um, list of graduates. So congratulations to those kids. I went and read all of them. It's awesome. Yep. Good job by all of them. All right. Uh, could we do the roll, please, Gary? Lynn Grassi. Aye. John Hack. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Motion carried. Buildings and grounds. Motion to approve uh, item A listed on the Billings and Grounds consent agenda as recommended by the superintendent. May I have a second, please? I'll second it. Thank you, Mr. Miley. Any discussion? Um, yeah, I have a question on this. Um, considering that this is going to be an expensive addition to the high school and that um, can somebody please address how this will be affected if we move forward in the future with a new high school and how much of this will be usable or not usable? Do you want me to speak to that, Jim, as, yeah. as much as I can? I, I think what we, what we also ought to point out too is the fact that this is basically for preliminary design too. And we're not, uh, but I understand. I mean, we're not voting on the, on the hundreds of thousands of dollars that will take to upgrade. I do know that there's some equipment that we can use in uh, a newer building. Most can um, elaborate on that. So just again, to reiterate what Jim said, this is um, just for the work that TDA has done in the design. I don't think the intention was ever to not bring the design to the board. There just isn't a design yet. Um, I don't know if it'll be in a formal presentation or something that will be presented through a Friday packet. Um, but before we would move forward and expend any of that money, um, I realize it has to come to the whole group. But at this point, there isn't anything to bring forward. We have to, we have to pay for the services and they're finishing up that design now. Because of the timing of our board meetings, this process is almost finished, even though we are just, you guys are just now approving um, the expenditure of the money for the design. So we should have those documents probably, I would say, within the next week um, that we can review. And that does this, so this, this is, we're not going to be approving the actual project yet. No, this, no, this is just to approve the work that TDA is doing to get us ready to do the project. Right. Now I have, I've met with buildings and grounds and I have met with the curriculum committee and they know the basic idea of what we're trying to do. But other than that, we don't have, we don't have any formal plans or have not looked at any formal plans yet because they don't exist. Yeah. In order to bring you a number of what it's going to cost, we had to get this design done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I understand that. I just want to make sure that people, whatever we decide to do at any point in time in the future is that we, we are coordinating that with our, um, facility plan um, so that we're not spending money if we're going to just be replacing it. That's all. So that's all I wanted to make sure. Yeah, it, 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 the TDA contract includes the entire scope of the project. So we go out to bid and then decide that we don't want to move forward with the project. We won't be paying the entire contract. We'll pay through what part of the design phase we went through. The, the, the proposal from TDA includes including like the construction oversight and close out and all that stuff as well. We would just be using the design portion of that proposal. Um, this originally started as a grant application that we were going to apply for a workforce grant from the state of Ohio. That got pulled as well with the state funding cuts. Um, and then obviously we made the decision to continue to move forward to bid it out. And you know, some of the building equipment that be part of this lab could be reused in the facility. Obviously some of the building upgrades for electrical and things like that obviously would not be usable in the new building it'd just be you know 
be what it is. But, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a good program for our students that we should continue to move forward with. And then, uh, you know, we'll see how the funding, if there's any other funding opportunities going forward, but we are planning and if we do move forward to use the permanent improvement fund, which we now have um, a little bit of a balance in to be able to do a project. So the, and this project, this project is not, um, like students aren't gonna be able to be doing part of this. I know because it's a consortium of four districts. Are they gonna be able to participate in this program in the fall or no? This is not like a fall thing. No, there's, it originally was was going to be that. I have to say that my friends at TDA were really super happy and maybe the only ones when the, the COVID-19 crisis hit because it put the brakes on me and the fact that they could, we couldn't move quite as fast, this is in no way, shape, or form going to be ready to go in the fall. So we have to have a discussion about whether or not we'll do, the if we decide to move forward with the renovations, if we'll do them in the fall or if we'll start them in January. So that's the, the other, next piece. Are the other districts ready to move forward? You know what? We honestly, Belinda, we haven't had a chance to circle back around and revis revisit some of this. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't. Everybody's been scrambling. So yeah. I was just thinking about that, though, and, and I have a couple of meetings for other things with several of those um, administrators. So I will be circling around to see I, that we can't offer it. I have already put that word out to a couple of them. Um, okay. Melissa, while, while we're talking about this, I'm not sure if anyone's watching the, the uh, meeting or we'll watch it later, um, explaining what this means. I mean, we're spending, you know, maybe $30,000 on design on a project that may cost a couple hundred thousand dollars. We're not sure yet because we have to finish the design. But it doesn't only mean that we have access to a welding uh, program on our campus. It opens up a lot of other opportunity because of uh, an agreement we have with other districts. So even though we're spending this money on the welding, our students are getting, uh, can get other opportunities elsewhere, not in welding, correct? Yes, that's how, that's how the whole consortium idea started with each one of the member districts um, bringing forward a program. So Perry has a construction program, Wycliffe was looking at starting an EMT program, and Painesville City already has an HVAC program started. And this is trying to feed into some of what we've talked about in the past couple of years about increasing opportunities for our students that are um, outside of, of college focus. So looking at a little bit more of career um, readiness, the, the program itself, whereas right now kind of what we run is an introductory welding program. So kids can take welding one or two and they get a little bit of a taste of, of what it means to weld and some of the, the basic principles, but then they go to Auburn if they want to really further their opportunities. We are not a program that's going to compete with Auburn, however, because we will be focused strictly on seniors. And that's what all of these um, programs are looking to do, is to focus on senior credentialing, which means seniors will get credentials and be employable and have skills when they graduate. My, my point, my point with this obviously is the fact that it goes beyond the opportunity goes beyond just welding. Yes. And, and I would say just as part of the discussion, I mean, that was part of the uh, in previous conversations between the board and the administration that the board was hoping to define other opportunities for for students who are not on the, the college bound track to, to have um, additional options. And so this is right in line with that and, and coupled with our association with the other three programs that Dr. Malacher mentioned, I, I do think it's truly an opportunity for, for us to expand the scope and options. And, and it's, it ultimately is a, a very positive uh, enhancement to what we are able to offer here at, at the high school. So any, any other discussion? One, no, thank you for the thing. clarifications. One thing I wanted to add just for you, Melissa, to think about is last week in the news, um, the Greater Cleveland um, Welding Union is putting together a program to hire high school graduates, train them, and guarantee jobs. Um, it might be something we might want to look at too is seeing if they can help us out with any of this as we move forward too. 
And, and thank you, Jack, for sharing that. I, I will look in to see if there's any kind of partnerships available. Okay. All right, any other discussion? All right, can you call the roll, please? Tom Hack. Aye. Lori Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Belinda Grass. Aye. Motion carried. And that takes us then to the Board of Education update. If anyone has got anything. All right, just like to congratulate our graduates. Yeah. Woohoo! Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll see them on June 13th and 14th. That's exciting that we at least are able to still do something to see them personally. So that'd right. be great. And hope for good weather. <laughs> yeah, there's that. All right, if there is nothing else, I'm gonna make a motion at 8.47 p.m. to adjourn to executive session for matters of purchase or sale of property. If I could have a second, please. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hack. If there's no discussion. Let's call the roll, please. Corey Kroniski. Aye. Jack Miley. Aye. Jennifer Harden. Aye. Belinda Grassi. Aye. Tom Hack. Aye. All right. And don't forget, board members, there is Jack. There is a different link for the executive session to make sure you go in. Are we coming back?